Hey everyone, welcome. Today we're talking about forms, a whole bunch of different elements in HTML, including forms, uh, inputs, text inputs, email inputs, password inputs. We're going to see radio buttons, uh, selects, and option elements. We'll talk about validations. We'll talk a little bit about HTTP requests and query strings. We'll cover buttons and checkboxes and uh, my personal favorite, the color picker input. And I'm sure I'm already forgetting some stuff, but there's a lot we're covering. Uh, oh, labels. That's actually a very important one. Not the most exciting, but a very important element as well. So you can download the code for today uh, in the description of this video. It's just a link. You can see the, the end result code of what I type. Uh, there's also a solution to the assignment from yesterday if you are following along with every day of the course. One small announcement, I am not feeling great. Starting uh, started earlier today, um, I'm fine, but I, I was pretty short of breath when I was recording this and uh, <laughs> feverish. So I don't know if I'm gonna get a video out for tomorrow. Um, we'll see how it goes. Um, if not, I'll hopefully have it for Monday. So I'm sorry if I sound a little bit out of breath in this video. I tried to edit around it, but um, well, I was having trouble breathing. <laughs> Always great. Anyway, I hope all of you guys are staying healthy and safe and all of that. Alrighty, so now we're gonna talk about forms in HTML, but we're actually not gonna talk about the form element first. We're gonna circle back and cover that because the form element on its own is kind of useless unless you have inputs or elements that go inside of a form. So we're gonna start with the various form inputs that we can use in HTML. We're not gonna cover all of them. There are lots and lots of different types of inputs, but I'm gonna go over the important ones. So there is an element called input. Input is super versatile. It accepts an attribute called type. And if we look at the type attribute here, all the available options, we've got button, checkbox, color, date, date, time, local, email, file, hidden, image, month, number, password, radio, range, reset, search, submit, tell, text, time, URL, week, and then an obsolete value date time. We are not going to go over all of these, but you can see examples of all of them here on the right side in this table. There's another example of a table from yesterday. So um, why don't we start with the simplest one, which is a text input. It looks like this right here. It's just a text input. You type text in there, pretty straightforward. Let's go over to a new HTML file I've created called forms.html. It has nothing in it except an H1. And I'll add a little H2 that just says text input, just so we can break up the different inputs and you can see what they are. Then we'll write an input element, which does not have a closing tag. It's just a single tag. We don't put text inside of it. Instead, we add in the attributes that are necessary, including type. So type equals text will give us a simple text input. I'll refresh the page and there it is. I can type in there. I've got a text input. There's more to inputs. One of the most common attributes is the placeholder attribute. Placeholder allows me to pass in some placeholder text. So something like username and placeholder text shows up when there is nothing in that input, but then as soon as I start typing, it goes away. So it's just a way of providing some context or a hint as to what this input is for. Later on, we'll talk about labels, um, which are a better way of, or an another way of providing additional information about particular inputs, but placeholder text is really common. So we can make a single input. Um, if we have another input, you should know that uh, they are inline elements. So if I have another one, let's see, username and uh, what's another thing we could ask for? City, I'll refresh. You can see they are inline elements, not block level elements. They sit nicely together. Let's take a look at a couple other input types. We have an email input. Now an email input uh, looks just like a text input and you won't really notice a difference until we put it in a form, but I'll just throw one in here email input we have input type equals email this time and i'll add a placeholder email i'll refresh the page it looks the same you won't notice anything as you type uh, but there is some validation behind the scenes once we hook this up inside of a form it will not let us submit the form unless we have a valid email pattern in here as you can see there it gives me a little note Please include an at sign in the email. Adjeck is missing an at sign. Anyway, next up, we've got some others. Um, why don't we take a look at one of my favorites, not very commonly used, but a color input. 
So let's try that. Uh, let's add a H2 color input. And then we add our input element, input type equals color. No placeholder text for this one because it is not a text-based input where we're typing something in. Instead, we click and we get a color input or a color picker. Now this is going to depend on the browser you're using, the particular uh, picker, the system that you're on. You'll see a different color picker, most likely, but it should let you pick a color. And we haven't really talked about how colors are represented uh, in the browser in CSS or JavaScript. How do you actually you know, take this exact shade of green versus that exact shade? There are numeric codes behind the scenes. So if I pick some color here, how about a purpley color? I close out. There is a numeric value in that input. And speaking of value, there is an attribute I can add to every single input called value. And this is how I can actually preload text into one of these inputs. So instead of just having a placeholder text like city there, I could actually put real text in there. If uh, let's say I was creating a form to edit something like to edit the title of a blog post. And if I wanted the title to show up there, instead of you having to type it from scratch, I could do something like this value equals, and then put some name in here. Let's see. What's a city. How about Panahachel? city in Guatemala, you can see that that text is actually there. I can edit it. It is not the placeholder text. If I delete it, now we go back to the placeholder text. So we can do that for all of these inputs. If you do it for a color input, however, and you try and set a value to be, you know, like, hello, it's not going to be very meaningful. But if you set it to a color code, which is something we have not discussed, but if I put some code in here, like that color right there, now it's set to default to that brown color. So not something we're really going to go into, but yes, you can set an initial value for a color input as well. Okay, other types of inputs. Um, there's date inputs. These are kind of obnoxious in my opinion. Uh, there are nicer ways of getting a date picker where you can get like a pop-up calendar where you can select a date. So most modern websites don't use these. There are pre-made date pickers and calendar little widgets that you can include in your app once we get to JavaScript. So for now, yes, there is a date input, but I don't really like it. We also have uh, a month input. We have a number input, which wants you only to type numbers. So I'm typing letters now. It doesn't work. We get those little buttons and I can increment the number. Let's try one of those. H2 number input, and then we'll add an input type equals number. Refresh. And there it is. So I can't type letters, but I can type numbers. We can do things like a min and a max, also a step interval. So that step will uh, dictate how much we go up or down by with these arrows. So I could do something like, let's do um, an odd number picker. So let's say min is one, let's say max is 10, and step is two. I'll refresh, here we go. Also notice it changes the size of the input based off of that max. And as I go up, we hit nine, that's the max. Well, 10 is, but our step is two. So that is min and max and step. Next up, a very important input, the password type. So we'll do one of those down here, h2 password input, and then add in an input type equals password, refresh. It looks like a regular text input, but as I type in here, my text is obscured. So very important. Now, that does not mean that the text is a secret. It just means that it's not showing up. So if someone's looking at my computer, uh, but I can still go get the value from this using JavaScript. That information has to be sent somewhere when you submit the form. So you're not hiding it from the computer. You're just hiding it from prying eyes. And it's always a good idea to include a placeholder. Placeholder equals password. Okay, there it is, and then you type, and we get those little dots. Alrighty, so those are some basic input types. There are many others. We're going to come back and talk about checkboxes and radio buttons. But first, I'd like to talk about labels. So in a form, labels play a very important role. And when I say labels, I'm referring to the pieces of text that correspond to individual inputs. Not the placeholder text inside, but an actual separate element. It's called a label element. And it plays two main roles. 
First of all, each label is associated with a particular input. So if I click on that label, it will focus me, it will move my browser's or the cursor's attention to that input. And that can be useful, I guess, with a mouse, but especially on touchscreen devices uh, and smaller devices. If you have fat fingers and you're trying to select something and you happen to miss it, but you hit the label, it's a much bigger target. But the second reason to use labels is for accessibility purposes, for making your websites accessible to people and your forms accessible to people who are relying on screen readers. A screen reader, when it gets to a particular input, will read out the corresponding label automatically. So let's say that we were using a screen reader and we're focused on this input. The placeholder text is not that informative. We know it's an email, you at example.com, or it appears to be an email, but the label text really contains the instructions. And you could put this as a paragraph tag. You could put, I mean, you could do whatever you want to try and structure your form and put some helper text. But the label element is special because it gives us a way to associate the label with each particular input. And it's also what screen reading software will be looking for automatically. It will be expecting a label on each input. So creating a label is pretty simple. It's just a label tag opening and closing. And then we can put some text like enter a strong password. If we refresh, yep, we just get some inline text there as you can see. Right now they are not associated in any way. So I'm clicking this label, nothing's happening. In order to associate a label with an input, we have two main options. One is to nest the input directly inside of the label. The second option uh, that's much more common is to use two particular attributes, one on the label called for, F-O-R, and then the second attribute goes on an input and it's called ID. Now ID is something we will come back to when we get to CSS and styling. IDs play a role outside of just labels, but this is how you can set a label to correspond to an input. So we give this input an ID of P's and this label a for attribute of P's, which is matching that. So we could do the same thing here, ID equals password, and then our label will have a for set to password, matching that ID attribute. So if we refresh, we shouldn't notice a difference. But if I click, now I have a massive target to get into that input. And if I were to use a screen reader and focus on that input like that, it would automatically read out that label text. And we will be doing one more lecture on HTML tomorrow when we cover uh, semantic HTML and accessibility. And I'm thinking I'm gonna actually use a screen reader and try and demonstrate some of this. So we'll see how that goes. Let's do one more. Um, let's have another input, just duplicate this, a password input that will be to confirm your password. So I'll add a label, confirm password. Okay, and then we just wanna associate them and I'll change the placeholder to say confirm password as well. And an ID for this one, maybe we'll call this PW confirm or just confirm and then four equals confirm. And there we go. We now have helper text or label text for both of these inputs and they are correctly associated. But make sure that you have those IDs matching, ID matching four. If I swap that, for example, if I set confirm as the four attribute on this first label and I refresh, when I click here, we end up focused over there. So that ID and the four attribute do play an important role. So now that we've seen a couple examples of inputs, different types of inputs, we'll actually see a few more. Um, but first, we're going to cover the form element itself. So there is a form element in HTML. It does not look like anything. You won't see it on the page. However, we use it to create a form uh, that will eventually submit data somewhere. So these inputs on their own are just inputs which you can use. Once we get to JavaScript, you can use JavaScript to um, read a value out of here or do something with a value. But the traditional way that we set up a form in the browser is by using a form element. And the form element has a couple special attributes that are gonna take a little bit of uh, explanation to understand. So we'll start by just adding a basic form. Um, I'm just gonna do an example down here. So we'll put in eh, just an HR to divide things up. Let's do a, uh, hmm, 
what should I do here? Another H2 form element. And then after that HR, I'll actually put a form in. And you'll see if I use that autocomplete in VS Code, it automatically adds in the attribute called action. I'll just get rid of that for a moment. Let's refresh the page. You don't see anything showing up down here. So the form element is basically a container that will hold various inputs. And then we can submit that form in one go, which we haven't seen how to do yet. But when we do, we will submit that form. All of the information um, from those inputs, however many we have in there, will be sent in a new HTTP request. So very early on, day one of this course, I talked about how we generate a new request. One option is just refreshing a page, um, you know, like that. Another is clicking a link. And a third option is submitting a form. So when we create a form element, we actually specify where this data should be submitted to. So that is what the action attribute does. And I'll just start by leaving this blank. Um, and I'm gonna put, I don't know, maybe a, an input for a username in here. So we'll do a placeholder equals username. And then let's do a password as well. So input type equals password. And we don't need any of that for now. Type equals password, uh, placeholder equals password as well. And if I refresh the page, okay, here is our form. We don't see anything. And uh, I also don't have a way of submitting this form, which is the last missing piece. Well, one of the missing pieces. We need to add in a button. So to make a button in HTML, there's two options uh, in the context of a form. One is an actual button element. It looks just like this. And we'll add some text in there like submit. I'll refresh. Now we have a button. And if I type some stuff in here, username and password, I click submit right there. I don't know if you caught that. My page reloaded. I'll try that again. I'm just gonna hit submit, watch right there. It reloaded. If I change the action here to be, um, I don't know, candy, and I submit, I'll have to refresh the page first to get the new version of my form, submit it. Now it takes us to slash candy. If I replace this with www, let's do http colon slash slash www.google.com and save, refresh my form, I submit it, it takes me to Google. So not something you would normally do, but this demonstrates that we are just making an HTTP request. When a form is submitted, that action attribute specifies where the data should be sent. So usually you will have, if you, once we get further along or if you're working with your own server uh, or on an application, you usually have some endpoint, you have some place that you're submitting your data to. Right now we're just learning HTML. We don't have anywhere to send it to. So we're not really gonna do anything with it. Um, but I'll leave this as Google just so you can see that it does indeed send data to Google. Although right now it's not actually sending anything. It is sending a request, but it's not sending any data. What we now need to do is add in another important attribute to our inputs. Each input in a form should have a name attribute. And name is the name of the piece of data. It's kind of like a label for that piece of data uh, when it is sent to a server. So whatever you put in here, I would just go with username and password, will be used to label the data, the actual value in here and the value in here when it's sent to a server somewhere, or in this case, it's submitted and a request is sent to google.com. Refresh the page, we don't see a difference. And I'll put something in the username, I'll submit. And now you'll see something that we did not have before in the URL. I'll copy this out, just copy that whole URL, paste it so we can take a closer look. It has HTTPS www.google.com and then this thing at the end, question mark, username equals dogfan1 and password equals ASD, ASD, AS. That is what I typed in the password input. That's what I typed in the username input. So whatever this name is, if I instead called this uh, USR for user, that will be the name that the data is sent under. And if I did pass instead of password, and I just repeat that process one more time. Let's put something in there. I'm just gonna type gibberish. You can see what we end up with. 
that name change that we made impacted the actual request that was sent, USR and pass. Anyway, we're kind of getting a little bit further ahead than we need to because we're not going to be submitting our forms anywhere, uh, but you should know that forms do have this action attribute. It specifies where the data goes. So if we look at a more, uh, well, a form that actually works that was not created by us, like on Reddit, there's a search form here. And if I actually inspect that search form, which we haven't really talked about inspecting things, but if you right click in Chrome, inspect, it opens up the dev tools and shows you uh, the corresponding HTML. So we can see we have a text input in here, or actually it's a search input. It's very similar to a text input, except it removes the uh, any enter keys, any returns. And it's embedded or it's nested in a form element. And that form has an action of slash search slash. Now this is important. This is a Reddit endpoint. So it will be reddit.com slash. And then you'll, well, let's just see what happens. When I submit something in here, the name of this input says Q for query. It's kind of standard or pretty common for uh, search inputs to use Q, but you don't have to. Let's search for something. We've got some geese here. Let's look for chicken. So I'm going to hit search or just hit enter here. You'll see that we get a new request and pay attention to the URL. This is what the URL looks like. Not quite the chicken results I was hoping for. These are all cooked chickens. <laughs> if I paste this URL in here, you can see we ended up with slash search. And then this thing at the end, it's something called a query string where we have that question mark. We're not going to get bogged down in it. All I want you to know is that whatever I typed into that input, which was chicken, was sent as part of this request under the name of Q. And then Reddit server is set up so that whenever it gets this request where Q is chicken, it's going to find results that match chicken and build me a page, a search results page and show it to me, send it back. So I could actually just search this way if I change that to be, um, I don't know, geese and hit enter. I don't need the form. The form is just a convenient way to get here. Uh, so I don't have to type stuff in the URL, but it's just sending a request at the end of the day. Now, technically there are different types of HTTP requests. We're not getting into that. Um, if you want to learn more about that, you can go onto the form MDN page. This is something we'll have to cover eventually, but at the moment it's just kind of overkill since we can't really do anything with the data, but you can set a method attributes. That's all I'll say. Post and get requests. Those are worth looking into if you are curious, but it doesn't really matter with what we're doing at the moment. Okay. So one kind of fun thing that we can do is actually set up our own form that will act as a Reddit search form. So if all that we need is to send data to reddit.com slash search and we want a query string to be there. Query string is this whole thing here, question mark something, or if we go back to my example, this whole thing is the query string. We have multiple pairs here, user and pass. They both have corresponding values. All that we need to do to make this work is basically send a form request to this URL right there. So we could make a new form form action is that and then we'll add an input type equals text and then we need to add a name and reddit is expecting the name of q so i could add my own name here i could go with query instead i'll add a little h2 that says reddit search form and then i'll add a button at the end to submit come back to my page here it is I'll refresh the page, get my latest code. I can search on Reddit. I'll type something in there, submit. But it's not quite going to work because I did not send the data under the correct name. Now, this is not something you would normally do, right? You're not going to normally have a form that sends data to somebody else's or to some other server. In fact, a lot of servers don't let you do that in the first place. But long story short, it is telling me no results for empty string or empty quotes basically it thinks that I didn't send any data because on the server side, it is looking for the value of something called Q, not query. As we saw, the name is Q. And so now if I send my data under Q, I'll do a search for ducks. It will take a moment and it takes me to reddit.com slash search slash, and then this query string Q equals ducks. And I can see ducks results. Now let's go back and talk about buttons. 
So we saw that we can add a button element um, and that will submit a form. However, that actually isn't always the case. Depending on the browser you're in and how many uh, buttons you have and the order that they are in, some browsers will only let the button submit the form if it's the very last element in the form or if it's the last button at least. In this case, in Chrome, I just tested it. It actually worked fine. I tried every possible way to show you uh, that multiple buttons might confuse it or that you know only one of them is going to submit the form, but actually, I couldn't prove it, uh, but in other browsers, I have had experiences in the past where if you have more than one button, if it's not the last thing, it will not submit the form. So if you trust me when I say that, there is an alternative way to submit a form. There's actually another input type where the type is submit. And this will submit the form. It generates a button. If I save that, if I refresh, you can see it right there. And I can specify a value here since it's an input, it's not a, uh, it doesn't have an opening and closing tag. It's just a single tag. And I don't have anywhere to put text like I do for a button between opening and closing tags. So we add in a value. Refresh, and now I can change that value. And this will submit the form as well, although I haven't actually typed anything in there. Okay, so to recap what we've seen so far around forms. A form element itself visually does not display as anything. It acts as a container or a parent for inputs. If you want to submit those inputs together, you want to take the values or the information in a collection of inputs and submit the data to some common place in a single request. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense for us right now since we don't have any way of working with data or implementing a server or really just any reason to send data anywhere. But if you specify that action attribute, that tells the form where to send the data to. And then name is a very important attribute for each input in a form. It specifies what the data should be sent under. What will be the name for this one piece of data? What will be the name for this one? We also should have labels in here. Um, just it's best practice like we did up here. So I'll make sure to add that in before you uh, download this code or before I upload it so you can download it. And then um, there are some other inputs that are slightly more advanced, including checkboxes and radio buttons. So radio buttons look like this, at least by default in Chrome. They look different in, in other browsers, slightly different at least. They are kind of like checkboxes, except um, generally the whole idea is that you can only have one selected or one chosen in a given group. So with checkboxes, we can have multiple in a group and I can check both of them or I can check one of them. With radio buttons, I'm toggling uh, and just picking one at a time. So in order for this to work, we actually have to associate three radio buttons, or if we have 10 in a group, I need to associate 10. To make a single radio button, it's pretty easy. Um, let's see, where should I do this? Do it here. Another H2, radio buttons. It is just input with type set to radio. And if that's all you have, you can see it right there, there's a radio button. So in order to give it some context or a label, we use the label element. So I'll do that here, we'll add a label afterwards. Um, what will we be choosing? Let's do a little paragraph here, pick a color, sure. And then we'll have red as the first one, we'll give this an ID, go with red, four equals red. So now I just have that radio button and I can click on the label and notice I can't undo it. So that's how radio buttons work. You don't toggle it off. But if I have other radio buttons, so I'm just gonna duplicate this and have an orange and a yellow. So I'll just update that. Orange, take the text here, make it orange. Same thing here. So we should now have three choices, but they are completely independent. I can have all of them selected. The idea with radio buttons is that I make a group of them. And to make a group of them, I just use the name attribute and I give them the exact same name. So I'm gonna select three cursors here by holding option down on each radio button input. And I'm gonna set name to be color. That's what they represent, the choice of color. Refresh my page, and now I can only pick one because they have the same name. Okay, so that's radio buttons. Um, however, 
there's an important thing that we have not considered yet, which is if you submit this data from a form, if I had this radio button group in a form, like this form right here, um, I'll just copy this down there so you can see what it looks like. Put that in this form, refresh. If I type a username in, I type a password, and I select yellow, I hit submit. Remember, we're sending this to Google. This is the data that was, or the URL that was generated. So it has username equals blah, 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 pass equals, and then color, which is the name, equals on. Why is it saying on? I want it to extract the value that I selected. So red or orange or yellow. The thing is, I haven't actually added a value in here. So that's the last piece for a radio button. We add in a value. And for each one, we would have a different value. So if you selected this radio button, maybe your value is red, this one would be orange, and this one would be yellow. This is just telling the browser when this input or when this radio button is the selected option, send color as this value. So color will be yellow or color will be orange. So I'll refresh back on my page again. I'll select orange, submit. Up there, we can see color is now orange. So next up, we have checkboxes, which are very pretty straightforward to make. Um, you set type to be checkbox. It's an input element. Give it an ID so that we can label it. Otherwise, without a label, there's no way to specify text or any information about what you're checking. And then uh, what else is there? A name that specifies what the data or the value will be sent under, just like all the other names. And then there is this one attribute, a Boolean attribute, a yes or no, we don't set it to a value, called checked. So if that is present, let me refresh this, you can see it begins checked off. So we'll add one of those in just very quickly here. Uh, let's do that down here again. H2, check boxes. We have input type equals checkbox. We'll give it an ID of likes dogs, and then we'll give it a label afterwards or, or before, it's up to you. And the label text will be I like dogs, and four matches this ID likes dogs. I'll refresh my page one more time, and we now have I like dogs as a checkbox. I can check it or uncheck it. I also can add in that attribute checked right there, refresh the page and it starts off checked, but I can still uncheck it. All right, so those are some of the other inputs. Now, there are two things I'd like to mention that are not actual input elements, but they are valid form elements. So they are I inputs in general, in the sense that a user enters data with them, but they are not actual input elements, the input that we've been seeing for quite a while in this video. And the first one is a text area. It represents a multiple line plain text editing control. So something like this, where it's multiple lines, you can grow it or shrink it if you wanted to in the browser. And again, it is not a input element and it's actually a opening and closing tagged element. It's not the right terminology, but it has an opening and closing tag. And then the value, the text that is inside of it will be displayed. So let's do one after checkboxes, text area, and then I'll add my text area just like that. And you'll see that the VS Code autocomplete already gave me columns and rows or calls and rows. This allows me to specify the size of this text area. So if I just do that and refresh, there's our text area. So this is in characters, how many characters wide and how many characters tall. So 10, we should have 10 rows there. I, I already lost count, but that should be 10 characters tall. So if I change that to be, uh, how about three, how about 100 wide, 100 columns? There we go, much wider. Uh, we can leave it at that. And then if I wanted to put some data in there, I can just do lorem ipsum, lorem tab in VS Code. Gives me some random, I think it's just random Latin. And there we go, it's in there. Now a user can always grow this or shrink this. We're just giving it the initial starting size. Now the very last element we'll look at is the select element, which really uh, is two different elements we need to consider. So a select is going to give us a menu that we can pick an option from, and it actually it consists of a bunch of option elements. So a select on its own doesn't do a whole lot. We have to add in options, and you've probably seen a bunch of these before. So let's try making one. 
let's say that uh, for this Reddit example, if we actually go to Reddit and do a search again, um, watch the URL up here. I can actually sort by, let's do sort by top. And you'll see that there's a new parameter here. Sort equals top. So I could make a select to do that same thing on my Reddit search. Where's my select? Here it is. So I'm going to go to this Reddit form down here and add in, uh, I'm going to get rid of that submit button, add in a select, and inside of this select, if I just leave it as that and I refresh, we get this empty select and I can't even click to open it. So it exists, but I can't do anything with it. But if we add in some options, I add in some text here, like top, sort by top, and then we'll do sort by new, and what else does Reddit have? Uh, comments. I know there's something else in there. Relevance. Yeah, okay. Relevance. We'll do that one too. Okay, so now I should have three options I can pick from. However, if I submit this form, it's kind of, uh, let me zoom in a bit here. If I submit this form, if I look for chickens again, I want new. I do need to add in a name for my select. And if we go back to Reddit, that name that it's expecting is called sort. So if I want to match Reddit, I'll go with sort. So I'll try that again. New, we hit go. What happens? Oh, so close. So we're missing one important piece. If you notice here, we have Q equals chickens, that's supposed to be there, and sort equals, but there's no value. And that's because the text that we specify inside of the two option tags is purely for display purposes. We may want something much longer, um, you know, top posts or something like that, when the actual value that we would need to store or send to a server might be different. It might be just top, which I think is what Reddit is. It just wants top, their server wants new, and relevance, I believe, we'll, we'll play around with it. So now we have three options, each with a separate value. Whichever option is chosen at the time that this form is submitted, when the user hits this submit button, sort will be the name used to store one of those values as it's sent in the request. So let's try it again. Let's go back, refresh just in case. Let's look for tiger. And does it work? It looks like it, sort by new, and Q equals tiger. So the select element is really a partnership between select and the option element. We should add in a label and an ID. So let's add a label very quickly. It will just be uh, sort by, and then for, we'll just call this sort, ID will be sort here. And then we should also add in another label for our query input. We'll just do something like, search term oops put that in the wrong spot that should be the inner text between the uh, label tags and then this will have a id of search and four will be search okay there we go we have our label i can focus that's working correctly though maybe i'll format this ever so slightly differently um, i can use divs as one option for dividing up some of the space so if I want this to be on its own line, and then I want this to be on its own line, and then maybe the button on a third line, uh, we could just use a generic div. There are other options that we'll learn um, tomorrow, actually, that are less generic. But basically, a div will just give us some spacing here. Uh, and then thanks to CSS, later on, we can actually space things out nicer. Well, it still doesn't look great, <laughs> but it, it's good enough. We'll change the value here to be search. And uh, yeah, now we have a couple forms, really two forms, I believe. Uh, but then we also have a whole bunch of different inputs, different types of those inputs, text areas, check boxes. We talked about selects. We, we talked about radio buttons and how you can group them together. There's a lot, a lot that we talked about. Um, kind of nasty looking forms, but these are the foundation of all nice looking forms. Let's take a look at something like this right here. This is to sign up for Square. That looks like a password input. Let's uh, verify for sure, is it? I will inspect it. Input, 
type equals password. There we go. What about this right here? What is that? Let's inspect that. It is a select full of a bunch of options, as you can see there. So stuff we've already seen, just a little bit of makeup or face paint or something nice on top uh, to make it look better than what we've done, but the same elements behind the scenes. One last topic around forms are validations, client side or browser validations, basically checking to see that uh, a certain field has not been left blank or that uh, a number is between some range or that, um, what else, an email has to follow an email pattern. Those are things that we can do. So I'll do a little validation demo form down below. Just call this an H2 again, validation demo form. We'll make a form. Uh, we won't worry about the action. We'll add in, let's see, why don't we just copy some of what we've already done. Let's add in at least an input uh, for just a text input. We'll give it a placeholder of username and we'll add a button to submit at the end. So button submit. Okay, right now you can submit this form no problem with no, hmm, it's kind of annoying that there's uh, not much space at the bottom. Hopefully you can see this here. Uh, with no username, I can leave it blank. The page still refreshes. I know it's kind of hard to see that, but we are refreshing, which means the form is submitting. But there is an attribute I can add called required. Required is a Boolean attribute, a yes or a no. So if it's not there, it's not there. And if it is there, it means something is required. So we don't need to set it to required equals blah, blah, blah. It's just required, like checked for a checkbox. If I try this again, refresh and I submit. Now I get a warning. Uh, it's, well, it's more than a warning. It's asking me to please fill out the form before I submit the field. So this is a uh, Chrome specific validation. I switched over to Safari and if I do the same thing, it's close, but it's not exactly the same. Um, so these are browser specific. So that is making sure some elements cannot be blank or some input cannot be blank. We also have some other validations. So the simple act of setting type to email is going to validate based off of an email pattern. So it's not gonna check to see if an email is actually valid. It's not gonna send a request or something. Um, it's simply going to check to see if it has an at sign. And I think there's some other stuff. So it's asking for a username, I'll put that in there. Now, in order to show you this, um, I will need to make email required because right now it's not required. So it doesn't matter that email is not a, a valid email. But if I add required again, I'll refresh this and put in a username in there, submit, please fill out the email. So I'll put something in there. Nope, please include an at sign. So I don't have an at sign, so I'll put an at sign. Still no, please enter a part following the at sign. So that is considered valid. Even though it's not at all a valid email, it doesn't care. It just wants something and then an at sign and then something else. But it's better than nothing. Now for all of these validations that we're writing right now, all these simple things like required or type equals email, once you get to JavaScript or once you learn a server side language, uh, you can write much more rigorous validation. So these validations that we're doing with HTML are very simplistic. The last little bit of data validation I'll show you is setting a minimum and a maximum length for some input value. So I'm trying to think of an example. Um, well, for username actually. Often your username will have a max length. So you can't have like a you know 20 character username. Let's set it at 10 characters just to see how that works. I'll refresh. Username is still required, so I'll put something in there. And if I try and go too far, it just doesn't let me. <laughs> I'll submit and I get this issue here. I need to fill out the email. Now I have max length, I also have min length. So let's say min length has to be four characters for a username. If I type something in there and I try and submit, it's gonna tell me, please lengthen this text to four characters or more, you're currently using two. Anyway, those are some simple validations. And at this point, we've covered pretty much everything you need to know about forms. The main takeaways are that we have our input element, which is quite versatile with that type attribute. 
You should always add labels. So I didn't do that early on because we hadn't covered them yet, but you should add labels and associate them with the for attributes and the ID attribute on a particular input. Uh, we saw radio buttons, checkboxes, text areas, which are a standalone separate element. Unlike these, everything above is an input element. Then we also saw uh, the select element and option elements, and then the form container element, just a form that we wrap around various inputs and then submit, which will send a request and send our data to some endpoint or to some URL. And for now, we're sending it to Reddit or we're sending our data to Google for no reason, kind of useless, but I just wanted to demonstrate that you can send data and that's really the point of a form. All right, well, thank you for watching everyone. Um, I hope you learned something about forms. I hope you stay safe and healthy and uh, I'll be back, if not tomorrow, then soon enough with the next video, hopefully tomorrow though. Okay. Bye-bye.